Julian Barnes, who we went to high school together. And we're just doing a basic interview, which I'll let you tell everybody about because I don't really know what the interview is about beyond the creative. Part. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I got to uh, give me, bear with me, everyone. Um, I got to do my fam you spiel real quick. But greetings and salutations. I am Julian Barnes. I am a second year graduate industrial engineering student uh, from the FAMU FSU College of Engineering by way of FAMU. And today I'm going to be interviewing uh, Ms. Karina Krell on her artistic process. Uh, my graduate project, I'm not allowed to say at this moment, but my graduate project uh, um, heavily deals with um, focusing on how it is that artists create their art. So getting mm -hmm. this started, I wanted to just ask you Tell me about your artistic journey. I, I'm talking about from uh, toddler drawn on the wall to elementary, starting to use color pencils to high school, working with uh, clay. Just tell me your artistic journey. That's pretty funny that it, um, you say that because I definitely was a wall drawer. <laughs> like I would get in trouble for that um, until my parents decided that they were just going to let me do it because I was probably going to do it anyway. But I've been at this art creation thing for a really long time. I mean, people ask me like, when did I start painting? And my honest answer is, is basically like four years old, um, maybe a bit before. I basically have always been in that creative mind space. And I have very vivid memories from really early on in my life, kind of just painting watercolor paintings like I would this was when I was a little bit older than three I, I was maybe like five um but still kindergartner um I would pick up a stool from the kitchen counter at like mm -hmm. I, would, I always was um was enticed by the colors of the sunrise and so I'd grab the kitchen stool and I would put it at the front door and I would undo the lock and I would sneak out with my watercolor set <laughs> and I would go okay. and paint the sunrise um, up in mm -hmm. the sky, you know, back when I was like a child, child. And I would sneak back inside before anyone else had stirred that morning. And it just was like, I remember that being such an intimate experience, kind of just me and the sky sitting on the dock because we lived out on an island. So I was very oh, nice. like into the nature of that. And I started with clay really young too, because I would, um, <laughs> it's kind of funny looking back on it. Like I really followed this, the process of sculpting without knowing it. I would go out to the bay because we lived right across the street from the bay and then around the corner from mm -hmm. the beach. So I had a little bit of best of both worlds there and I would go out to the bay and when it was low tide, I would collect all the muck off the ground and I would put mm -hmm. it out on the limestone rocks and I would like pat it down and let it dry a little bit. And then once it was a little bit dry, I would sculpt a little, like I would do, I would always like to do snowmen, but like out of clay. <laughs> That never uh, yeah, that. the the forever thing of Floridians always wanting snow but never they, being able to have exactly. it. Exactly, I, I would do. I, they always just looked so like I don't know. It looked like fun to always make snowmen. You know, I would see that in books and movies and whatnot. So I would make my my muck men uh, with straw and clay, and I would let it bake out there. You know, for a whole another day and then after it would bake it would be hard and it was like a sculpture mm -hmm. so it was just kind of funny that i would like follow that actual process without having ever been taught how you know and so right. yeah those are some of my earliest memories and i think that kind of speaks to the intuition of art making because like i said i'd followed a process that is now, after, after having gone to school and been formally mm -hmm. trained, like, it's a very lengthy, detailed, meticulous process, at least specifically clay is. And so the fact that I was following intuition and 
doing the basic procedure of those things just as a child, never having been taught how, is pretty funny, I think. And I, I, I think it's important to gain formal training, but it also kind of goes to show, like, if you got it, you got it, you know? Got you. Yeah. So, so it's like, yeah. um, are either of your parents artists? Not well, my dad is very, I, w I don't think he would consider himself an artist per se, but he ha is very good with building, very good with his hands. He's a very, he is kind of got like an engineer mind where he mm -hmm. is really good at, um, I mean, he had a construction business for a very long time and he would create really a wonderful designs in brick masonry and he can just solve a problem like nobody's business. So I think that he's got some artistic uh, tendencies. And then I think my mom is, she's not as artistic really. Um, I think she's always had a really big admiration for it though. My uncles on both sides of my mm -hmm. family are really talented artists. Um, so right. it definitely runs in my blood they're different kinds of artists so my uncle butch on my dad's side he does a lot of like faux finishing and i would say he's more like in in, in like the painter realm so he can like mm -hmm. he could take a crappy piece of anything and make it look like it's marble or make it look like it's you know wood grain and stuff like that and then my like uncle, the youtube videos where you shine the ball of aluminum exactly exactly like that Got you. um and he has you know he kind of went into the the business side of things there where like he does have um you know a business where he will do foam finishes for people's houses and stuff like that um now he's more into wallpapering just because it's so much easier but my right. other uncle has always been he has a very um he has a really amazing hand not that my other uncle doesn't it's just i think i artistically with my mom's brother his name is Vito, um more just because i think we have similar like drawing styles in some way mm -hmm. and he i've always been very in in tune with his creative journey because when I was a little girl, he worked at the Museum of Natural History in Manhattan. And he, okay. have you ever been to the museum? No, no, I, isn't isn't it the same one from the Night at the Museum with uh, Ben Stiller it's or? One of, it's one of them. I know they came out with two movies. They did one in the Smithsonian and one in the Museum of Natural History. So the one, okay. the Museum of Natural History is that museum. Um, and he did the caveman exhibit. Like he sculpted the cavemen. Oh. So what most people have in mind when they think of like cavemen is his art. It's like, it's <laughs> it's pretty cool. awesome it is really cool but it's hilarious to me because he's such the recluse like he is the mm -hmm. definition he like he's the he's the artist that's like yeah lived in new york in like had in the studio apartment but basically lives with his parents like um mm -hmm. you know well he's well into his like 60s now all black cigarettes and black coffee, just more cigarettes, more black coffee. Seems like he should belong in France, something along those lines. Exactly. Well, I shouldn't even say that because now he actually, like, of all my my entire life and his entire life, pretty much he smokes cigarettes. And then this year, he's like, what am I doing? <laughs> I shouldn't so, I quit. Well, this is a good year to stop. This, this is a it's great hilarious. Year to stop. This year is like, um, it's just... I don't know, we can get, we can't even go into that yet, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but yes, like it, the, that's funny to me. And so he, he kind of always like, um, in a way embodied like the, the stereotypical artist of what other people kind of think, you know, that's what an artist is like. And mm -hmm. in some ways I'm really like him and in other ways I'm really not. So it kind of gave me a, um, a good gauge of my own self 
I just remember we would go to that museum and we'd visit, you know, him in New York and he would take us to like the behind the scenes and I could see all, I mean, we'd see the museum like everyone else saw it, but then we would go into the studios and I would see Mm -hmm. like- Oh, like the work studios where they actually make all of the- Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so we would see, um, and what's really funny to me is that the he did a, a specific sculpture that got a lot of notoriety, which was mm-hmm. a bust of a Neanderthal. Well, actually, it was a full body, but his face was the Neanderthal. Like he used his own face to cast oh, okay. everything and then sculpt it on top mm-hmm. of it. And so it's really funny because he was telling me recently, and I've been studying Neanderthals a lot. I'm reading a book um, by William Golding, and I just find them fascinating because they we some humans have uh, like four percent Neanderthal DNA, and so we right. now are seeing like there was it's not just that Homo sapien like ruled the earth; it's that we kind of crossbred before they eventually died out. And so my uncle has this like funny idea that he is the last Neanderthal. You know, mm-hmm. he was saying he watched a YouTube video doing some research just recently. And this guy was like ripping on how um, Neanderthals are depicted as human like, and it, they mm-hmm. flashed up a picture of my oh, his culture. Heart. And was like shitting on it, and he's like, "God mm-hmm. damn it!" And he like goes back into the you know his studio and stuff. But mm-hmm. it's just funny to show like you know the kind of ways that art really impacts the human mind and like the collective consciousness. Because my my uncle introduced me to all of that. I mean, in a lot right. of ways, and so. Um, you know, being able to see that behind the scenes and seeing the molds and seeing the casts and looking at, you know, in a museum, like what goes into an exhibit that isn't shown. Mm-hmm. And it's just like records and, I mean, all kinds of really amazing stuff. And it just really sparked a lot of curiosity in me very early on. And I definitely look back on that time and realized how unique it is. Like not a lot of people get that kind of introduction to right. the world. And so I'm really grateful for that and all the time that I got to spend doing that. Yeah, like my dad's an art teacher. So I grew up with, strangely enough, uh, my parents were so supportive of art for me when it was time for me to graduate high school and I was going in uh, for engineering and whatnot, they're like, oh, if you want to go in and do fine arts, we, we perfectly you know, support you and you know, switching your major or going to do fine arts. And it's like, you don't hear a lot of family members that are like, hey, yeah, let's switch out of a STEM field and do arts and we 1000% support you and whatnot. Yeah. So it kind of, it was, it was a lot, a lot of love when it comes from the artistic side. Cause like even my dad, he would bring in, um, what's it called, just regular, uh, sculpting clay and then he would like allow me to play with it and then he would go bring it back to school and then fire it for me and then bring back the sculptures and so it's kind of like oh, that fun. for me was one of those things that kept me interested in art from the jump where it was like I can see it transform from a block or a, a you know a mound of mush in my hand to an actual solid exactly. piece of work. It really changes your perspective because I mean clay has done that for me um specifically because it's that it's the literal earth (laughs) like Mm -hmm. it's it's actually alive and then you are able to kind of you know just turn it into something that's permanent really i mean it it will shatter but it can resist heat ridiculously so it's kind of amazing to see how the earth evolves in that way and i've thought that before like when sculpting or like throwing on the potter's wheel, I've had that like really trippy thought, like did dinosaurs walk on this? <laughs> like, you know, but it's a very possible thing. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a really, to me, it's just kind of like very abstract thought that's really out there. But I think that's somehow the only way I stay sane 
So it's really cool that you got that introduction to the arts too, because I, I similarly was very supported. Um, my parents always were just kind of like, do what you love. Like we busted our asses our whole lives so that you can do what you want to do. And right. I'm grateful for that because there are a lot of people I met in art school who like were disowned and mm. all kinds of stuff just for wanting to be an artist. It's like, right. it's who you are. So you can't really resist it. I guess you can. True. You'll be miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't turn out well because that's, that's one of the main reasons why I ended up actually coming back to school because I went, I got my degree in engineering. Um, I went on to the workforce for a year and to say I hated it would be too strong of a word, but I really didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back, um, I actually came back, uh, the degree that I'm pursuing now, industrial engineering, I'm doing it with the sole purpose of merging it with my mechanical engineering degree and my art minor that I got because I just kept taking art classes the entire time. And I'm trying to like go into the custom prop department for film and television. So I want to, you know, cool. my pitch That's to cool. them. Oh, thank you. My pitch to them is I am both a business mind, a technical mind and a creative mind at the same time. So yes. I can yes. communicate between all three different uh, branches that you need to cooperate to create all of the work that you have in your films and in your TV shows. Well, I'm sold. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Hey, job. Disney, hire me. Hey, you did it. <laughs> No, that's awesome. That's really good to hear. And it makes me happy to hear that specifically when it comes to engineers, because we, the minds of engineers and artists are so similar. Um, like mm -hmm. I got my minor in innovation and entrepreneurship, and I took an engineering entrepreneurship course in, as a part of my minor. And I was one of like four or five non-engineering majors and I was like one of four or five women in that entire room and I just remember always hearing the people in the room talk and talking to the people and just kind of thinking like we are so different but we are so similar at the same time like yeah. some, some of um, the go ahead Oh, the um, like Jasmine Gay, like because we were actually in the same classes, she was significantly better at engineering than me. But our running joke was always that we're becoming engineers to fund our art career because like every single one of the um, like our capstone projects that we had or even senior design projects, mm -hmm. she somehow managed to finesse it, turning it into a sculpture. Like she, I think for her senior design, she made a music box, like a giant scale music box. Oh, that is uh, so cool. Something along those lines. So it's kind of like, that was our running joke. And then the other thing as well is it was always an epiphany moment where uh, a lot of my friends who were in the um, uh, college of engineering, we all randomly found out that we were all artists at some point or another um, because um, for instance, someone had to like draw up a machine real quick. Mm -hmm. and so we were all trying to like go and do the, uh, the catting software or whatever it was. And then my friend Jordan, he was like, oh, don't worry. And then he just drew the entire thing out in like one stroke and we were like, wait, are you an artist? And he's like, well, yeah, but no one's ever asked me. And then I guess you could call me that. <laughs> and then it's and then it turns out like my other friend Brianna, uh, like we were just just randomly in conversation, like music got brought up, and she's like, "Oh yeah, I put I play five instruments." And I was like, "Where was this this entire time?" And it's like, "Well, you know, I just I do it for my church, and you know, I just every you know that's what I do on my weekends. I go and play music." Just we were like, the talented. When were you gonna tell us? <laughs> It's like, well, we were too busy being depressed during classes. So, you know, me being a musician never really came up. So it's like, oh. Wow, that's really funny. That's really funny. Yeah, I always uh, find specifically industrial engineers. And I think I'm a little bit biased because my boyfriend is an industrial engineer. But he's got the most artistic mind I've ever met. And mm -hmm. it's all data-centric, you know? So... I think, and I think I've got maybe a different opinion than other artists on this, but I also have a lot of relationships with engineers where I'm just kind of like, the definition of artist is evolving, you know? I think right. that 
all those people you described, like they are artists, especially in my mind. I'm like, lean into that, you know? And it's funny that, um, that joke that you and Jasmine had of like funding your art careers. <laughs> that oh, no, 1,000, 1,000%. Really that's... that's for sure. But mm -hmm. you know, everyone has a different way of a different path. So it just will unfold however it's supposed to. Oh, so um, question. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna, I guess, move more into the question part right now. So um, how would you describe uh, the level of artist that you are? Um, professional, amateur, student, or teacher? Or a mixture of any of the two? Um, I think probably all of those. I think, I, well, except for amateur. I'm not an amateur at this point. I can confidently right. say that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say master yet, although mm -hmm. I definitely think I have created some masterpieces. Um, I am always going to be a, a student. I don't think that will ever stop. I'm definitely a teacher, and I'm, I think I'm a unique kind of person to be able to do both, um, to be able to mm -hmm. just kind of dive into my – my own way of doing things and always teach like people in my studio spaces. Like I have a couple of friends that I'm thinking of that I was like closer to who would always like kind of like laugh when they'd see me interacting with other people in the studio because I can't help it. Like I will always begin in some kind of conversation where I end up like giving a full tutorial or instruction mm -hmm. or like something it's like because you know i have the information to offer and i what i learned from some really you can't really turn it off you know exactly. you, if, mm -hmm. and, if you gotta help someone you gotta help them learn too so like i like to i'll remember things that i forgot by um that i've learned my myself by teaching it to somebody else like or I just can't help it. Like I would see someone getting frustrated, like on the potter's wheel. Um, and I would know why they were getting frustrated because I could see that they were, mm -hmm. their hand maneuver was off or they were off center and their the gravity is like, is falling. It's making it fall off or like, right. you know, um, and then, of course, that would be me just observing. So I would, like, say, hey, like, I have this tip. Like, do you want to? And then, like, 15 minutes later, I'm, like, Maybe. full in it with them. There's that part of thing. And then also, I think I started gaining that reputation. And so people would come to me with stuff. And there were some days where I was, like, I need to just put headphones in and actually, mm -hmm. like, get. Yeah, I got to work on my portfolio right now. It's like, exactly. Yeah. But. Mm -hmm. There's a level of joy that I get from teaching others, whether it's about art or not. And I don't think that will ever leave me. Like that's part of, I have a very, very big vision for myself. That's like multifaceted from like lifelong for my career. And part of it is mm -hmm. to have, you know, and I've already kind of started this a little bit by just founding like an, my academy through like online, but like, long term I really see having a, an, a physical like location that teaches people art of the 21st century with like all kinds of technology and whatnot and um having all a place where all my protégés I call any of my students I call them protégés mm -hmm. <laughs> anywhere my protégés can go to um, you know, have a full curriculum and really learn. And so that's been an interesting evolution of this time to kind of dive deeper into like my natural call to teaching and to have some one on one students, which has been kind of slow to get up to that mm -hmm. just the nature of this time that we're in. But I see it more and more like I see people needing that more and more. So that's right. been sort of interesting, but to like fully really answer your question. Yeah. I, I think I'm definitely a teacher. I'll be a perpetual learner to the day I die. And, um, I would say when it comes to skill level, I'm really, really high up there. Like I have a very, very, um, genuine self-awareness and mm -hmm. 
I know exactly where I lie. Like, um, now in the most humble of ways, I say that I don't mean it to. No, say no, no, no. You good? I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it's just you have to know your own value. Like, I know my right. value. I know. I know that some people may find it preposterous to see like how what how much I might value my work at at the very mm -hmm. beginning of my career. But it's like, that's not anything because just wait 20 years from yeah. now and I'll, it'll have like- so a These are one of a kind and- to it, yeah. And it'll be a mm -hmm. fair price. And, um, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't happen on accident. Like people understand the art market and can take full advantage of that. And um, by the way, there are people who do that and don't really have the skill like- by like technical skill like mm -hmm. there's some i'm just saying there's some really expensive really ugly art out there so oh no i know exactly what you're talking about and it's okay like it, it's just the mm -hmm. it's just the way that it goes and i don't think they're wrong for that either i think if you're able to do that then go go for you like whatever mm -hmm. but i know where i'm gonna fall on that spectrum and having the actual skill is going to only like help in that process. You know what I mean? Well, kind of piggybacking off of that scene is how like it's, it would, it would be safe for me to assume that you are, you are a professional artist. Art mm -hmm. isn't just your passion. It is also your business. Yes. So what are some of the pitfalls that you have encountered so far as like trying to become, or not even trying to become trying to grow your business as an artist? Um, I think it's a good question. I I think there's no no different than um, any person trying to grow any kind of business. I think there's a I think artists have some extra difficulty because there's a level of like ego death that you have to go through because mm -hmm. it's not just a product or a service you're selling. Like it's your art and it's a part of you and it's whatever and whenever it whenever you are creating in that way it's very easy to get wrapped in the the idea that um like fuck them they just don't understand and it's like no <laughs> not fuck them like mm -hmm. they are your client like they are your customer yeah you still need to get paid at some point which means they're everything mm -hmm. right so right. you have to like i it's been an interesting journey and i'm really grateful for my learning process because i only have to make a bad decision once like i only ever have to make a mistake one time before i mm -hmm. like, really understand like and learn from what i did and that's inevitable like in any kind of business it's inevitable and in life it's inevitable and i am very entrepreneurial minded and always have been like you asked about my childhood at the beginning like the first time i ever sold a painting i was five like i oh, i had had a bunch of paintings that i had been working on probably snuck out to paint them right mm -hmm. I, had them, I had a little mini gallery space and i cut i took scissors and scotch tape and a ballpoint pen and I cut out a piece of paper to tape on the right corner of every single mm -hmm. one. And I would write like $50, <laughs> like, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I just kept it there in our house. And then one day, um, my parents' friends came over for dinner and they said, Oh, do you want to be an artist when you grow up? And I was like, Bitch, I already am an artist. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, look at the gallery. I didn't exactly like hello observe. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't skip a beat. I was like, this one's for sale, and they bought it. Like I sold my first painting for fifty dollars when I was five years old, and that's not a that's a lot of money now, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm just like, look at that, and I I remember that you know this is who I am. So to me, the journey has been very fluid like and it makes a lot of sense there are certain things that i have resorted to in times of you know financial desperation that i recognize now were like not the right move um mm -hmm. like 
to do things very kitsch and like, um, I'll make them, I'll make your mom a mother's day card. Like that was something I had done. And like, I was like, fuck, I need mm-hmm. money. Like I lost my job. Like, just like a lot of people in this pandemic and that weekend right. that was like, okay, I just got laid off. Like, and someone had suggested maybe you should do mother's day cards. It's coming up. And I was like, okay. So I made a little video and I DM'd every person the same message. And then I was like, wait, this is not a good idea. Like it only took me like getting like what, like two DMs back, like what? And then like another mm-hmm. idea, like this is like, I liked your art better when you didn't try or something like that. Right. <laughs> and I was just like, I was just like, oh shit, like this is not the right move. And then I look back at that now and I'm like, hello, like, first of all, not everyone has a good relationship with their mom. I probably just triggered a bunch of people. So oh, like, okay. Yeah. Like, for one, you know, like I just, I was thinking mm-hmm. empathetically, like what could have like caused any of these reactions. And like, that's, it's on me, you know, like, I'm not blaming, I'm not blaming their relation. I'm saying that was silly of me to even jump there. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I was desperate. So when you're desperate, you execute poorly, like it just happened. And so, like I said, it only took me one time. But what that did was it opened my eyes to recognizing, oh, like, I'm not being genuine if I'm sending a mass message to somebody like to have a successful business. It's really about creating and cultivating like one on one relationship with people like really genuinely caring like about Julian and his grad project. And, you know, like this is real. It's a Mm -hmm. real thing. And then but that takes a level of like I said, ego death, because why should everyone and their literal mother give a shit about mm-hmm. me and my art? Selling, you know, art. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and it's okay. I, I learned from it, but it's something that if I didn't make the mistake, like I wouldn't have learned. And I definitely recognized coming from that place of humility that it just wasn't a good move. And so I adapted, but I don't think that every business person has that in them. And I don't think that every artist has it in them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's okay. I just think that then maybe people should take a different path, but I'm literally like, I know I'm an entrepreneur because I can't do anything else. Like I'm not good at anything else. I I'm, I'm a terrible. That you know of, that you know of you, another, Light bulb can pop off in somewhere else and be the world's greatest juggler. That's true. And I should say that I know when I, when I'm going, I I will work for other companies in time Mm -hmm. and stuff. Like I don't, I'm not so, I'm not so stubborn that like, I'm not open to that. I, I very much am. It's just that I know when it comes, I'm talking more like the nine to five, like, um, like that's what Mm -hmm. comes to mind. And so there will be a time when, a, when, you know, the right company offers the right role at the right value. And at that moment, of course, I will move on to something else. Like, I think that that's a mm-hmm. big part of the process. Plus, when it comes, how I see my business and how I see it evolving, it takes a really long time to build a legacy company, you know, like, it, and I'm okay with that. Like I'm okay with putting in years and years and years of work and not really seeing the genuine, like payback until, you know, years down the road. Like that's part of the process. Mm-hmm. Always continue reinvesting money back into my art business and moving where life takes me, you know? Um, so I'm very, I'm very open to all of that. But I think that those are some of the things that like just candidly are pitfalls, you know, when it comes mm-hmm. to- that scare a lot of artists away from going yeah. further down the path. Yeah. And I think you have to be okay with learning um, back end shit. Like, it's not sexy to like mm-hmm. learn Google analytics or, um, you know, not 
not for me. Like it doesn't like just get me like, yeah, ads manager, like, yeah, organic mm -hmm. reach. Like those aren't the things that I love. Like I'm not a marketer. And then I, I there was a, a big pitfall that I recently just overcame was like that statement right there. I would be like, I'm not a mark, yeah. not a marketing person. And then it got to a point where I was like, what's a marketing person? Like, mm -hmm. it's just, you either take the time to learn marketing or you don't like there's, you right. know, it's not, you're not born. And then it's like, is it a boy or a girl? There's a science to being able to showcase your work. So, so exactly. and, and that science is marketing. So it's like and anyone and everyone can be a marketer. Exactly. And so it's funny because I came, I overcame that. I was like, I'm, this isn't my self talk that's holding me back. Like, this is ridiculous. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to, this month will be mm -hmm. my attention to like whatever month it was. I think it was um, April. I don't remember, but I set a one word intention for every month. And so, um, or no, it was June. June was gorilla, like, uh, guerrilla marketing and um, mm -hmm. the Gorilla Girls are an, an art performance group as well. That's like feminist art group that kind of like. So I'm assuming they pop out of the bushes and then like paint or do something and then jump right not, back into the bushes. Not too far off. They wore. Oh, I have the. This is their flag over here. It says, mm -hmm. "Dearest art collector, it has come to our attention that." Your collection, like most, does not contain enough art by women. We know that you feel terrible about this and we'll rectify it immediately. All our love, Gorilla Girl. So mm -hmm. They would um, wear gorilla masks and go on TV. This was like back in the early thousands or the 90s. And they would go on TV for interviews and like they would basically fuck shit up and um, they would call out the patriarchy of the art world and talk about mm -hmm. race issues and talk about, um, you know, they would use kind of before graphic design was a thing. They would like make little graphics and stuff. And it would say, um, you probably seen something like of there's, um, a painting of like a naked woman with a gorilla face, mm -hmm. like 87% of the, art in the Met Museum is of the female nude, but only 8% of the artists are women, um, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So they would take real statistics and kind of challenge like the status quo. Another one of my favorites is they would have, do you remember those old, um, like in a newspaper or on a, like a Gogur or something, it would ask like a question at the top and then on, mm -hmm. And upside down on the bottom, it would say like, hey. oh yeah, yeah, like with the fruit roll-ups. Exactly. So okay. they, they had one like that, and it was like, if February is Black History Month, then what do we do every other month? And the and the mm -hmm. bottom was like discrimination. <laughs> like, and it's so it just mm -hmm. like makes me laugh. But yeah, so that was like my intention. I was like, okay, if I can run with, they were marketers. Like they got their name out there. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, so. I was like, if I can set this as my intention for the month and just dive deep into learning like ad tools and like, what is, how do I benefit from marketing as an artist? Then, you know, that will be my intention. I'll return to that every single day this month. And it's amazing how something so simple as just like writing the word down gorilla and reminding yourself every day when you feel lost because it happens eventually like i felt mm -hmm. lost maybe most of those days that month with everything going on this year like right. just kind of being like oh my god what do i do and then just being like okay google this and watch the youtube video and like slowly but surely like you begin to learn certain things and that takes work it just does. Right. And so a lot of people don't want to do the work and that's okay. A lot of people won't rise to a point in their career as an individual, like independently, as mm -hmm. I know I will, that I'm on my path and everyone's life looks different and that's okay. You know? Gotcha. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Um, I think I have 
probably two more questions. I pro uh, two more questions. Um, I may have already answered this one. Um, oh, is there any style of art that you can't currently do that you would like to be able to do, or not even that you can't do, but a style of art that you would love to improve on? Yeah, I really miss. I just had started creating virtual reality paintings. Oh. Yeah, it's like a game changer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I had just started doing that at the end of my college career. I would rent out the Oculus Rift from mm -hmm. the science library at UF. And I I still haven't really posted much of, of that. Um, and I've been meaning to post one of the videos that I have. But and so maybe I'll do that after this just to give you some context. But so like building um, an environment in Unity or making like yeah and like a mini game that you interact with. Nothing interactive yet, but that was the direction I was going in. So I I like to use Tilt Brush, which is a a program by Google that is kind of like Unity, but it's heavy designer. Mm -hmm. So they have like a ma it took me like two hours just to play with all of the brushes. <laughs> like it's seriously insane. So um, mm -hmm. I had gotten to a point where I was really like doing, I would spend my days, my mornings I would be in studio classes because I was still in school. And then my days I would spend in the studio working in painting studio or printmaking studio. And then the evenings I would spend in the clay studio. And then the nights I would spend in the library. <laughs> and so oh, okay. it was like the purest form of hustle. Like I'm talking 19 mm -hmm. days. Like I would, I was, I couldn't have been happier. Like, um, oh. I was exhausted, but I was just like really in it. And um, yeah, I mean, you can create a whole universe because you're painting in 360 degrees. Like it's like it, it's the future. So it's funny because I feel sometimes like a really early adopter with that. Like mm -hmm. when I downloaded Tilt Brush, there were like a hundred reviews, and it was mostly. Um, and this was like on the Tilt Brush website. So it wasn't just like some Reddit thing. Oh yeah, it's a random forum somewhere. Yeah, no, this is like, this program has a hundred reviews. And um, it was maybe like 80 of them were computer science engineers or computer scientists who were just like, I'm not an artist, but this is cool. Like that kind of thing. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I, was, I was scrolling and I'm like, holy shit. like what did I just get into? So I, you know, I'd put on these goggles and I would go into the 360 blank canvas and mm -hmm. create anything. And, um, my, the, and, you know, I'll return back to that. Um, but it's something I really miss during this time, but it's probably best that I don't have that. Cause it'd be very easy to just like escape into that right now. Gotcha. Um, but I do have some really big aspirations for that, um, like business-wise. My goal in time will be to have, um, I actually have the headset right up there, but I, I bought um, cardboard headsets that you can put your iPhone in. Oh, yeah, the ones, mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. So I discovered mm -hmm. you can basically make... Um, youtube vr videos now like it's already for real yeah so it's a very new feature but it's a thing mm -hmm. um and so i was like if i can make this accessible um to people where they would like want to i could essentially and this is direct a direction i'll go eventually but um you know i can sell a, a piece of paper with a code that you scan or you know even mm -hmm. just a place online with a link that people can access a virtual reality sketchbook and just like you know a recurring album like they can mm -hmm. buy a membership basically to um new universes and so like with the cardboard headset idea you can access it through your phone 
that way it's more accessible because where we're at with virtual reality right now is basically like either you've got uh, $500 to drop on mm-hmm. the Oculus or the HTC Vive plus a programming com- a computer with a high enough GPU. Yeah, that can handle it. Right. Mm-hmm. Or a cardboard headset that you stick your phone in, but you can't pro- you can't design anything in there. You're just experiencing it. So my idea will be to have a middle of the line headset that is like experience based that mm-hmm. is very like sleek design and everything. Um, and it'll be like a recurring space um, that you can go to and have like the CDK experience. But um, that's going to take some time for sure. So that's what I mean when I say like reinvesting dollars and like letting this business evolve as it does. Like mm-hmm. I'm okay with not being there yet, you know, but I know that that's the direction that I'll go eventually um, once it makes more sense. But that's a medium I really miss a lot and I don't have access to it right now. Funny enough, that uh, what is it? VR reality was actually my senior design project. So we had to make, um, what is it like a virtual reality car that you could drive it and then they would have a live feed to an RC car. So it was essentially, we ended up making like, did you ever see black Panther? Um, yeah, what Shuri was driving, we ended up trying to make something very, very similar to that. It didn't work because we still had to have everything like tethered to the computer itself. So our RC car could only go like three feet before it would run out of the car, uh, run the length of the cords. But we tried, we tried really hard. That's really cool. Bluetooth is apparently very, very tricky. Didn't know that until we got 70% of the way through the project. But yeah, Bluetooth is very, very tricky. It's funny, that's really interesting. I actually, um, last October went to LA and I surprised my boyfriend to I bought us or my cousin actually did bought us tickets um to the Peterson Automotive Museum there and mm-hmm. they have everything from the Ford Model T to the car that you're talking about from Black Panther. So like I saw yeah. that person mm-hmm. very, very cool stuff. Like yeah, really- yeah. <laughs> what did it, it was a very much scaled down version of it was a significantly <laughs> scaled down version of that is no, but that's an on- RC car you could buy online and an Arduino or something. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, like, you could very well design their the next, you know, movie prop for that in the coming years. Not for that specific movie, obviously. Ooh, but hey, no, that's- no, I'm perfectly fine. Design for Black Panther two. I'm per- I'm perfectly fine with that. That's what I'm saying. Black Panther two will probably happen. Um at some point here and they're going to need some engineer artist minds. So, you know, that, if that's what you want for your life, I have no doubt it will unfold. Okay. Oh, and I guess you kind of answered the last question I was going to ask you, which was what are the new technologies that you would like to incorporate into your art? But you, you can answer that when you said the VR stuff. So it's kind of like, okay, that, Two birds, no, one stone. So it's a really interesting question because I think, um, yeah, I think VR is is one. More immediately, I'll be using AR. So I don't know how. Mm-hmm. Yet. Um, maybe you're a good person to talk to about this, actually. But I am finishing up my um, a book that I've been working on, which is called "Thank You, Damn It," and mm-hmm. it's all about radical gratitude and. Um, in incidentally, I, I mean, I started it in the first of January this year. And so it's kind of served as my Corona diary and has been in advertently a documentation of like a lot of what we've been going through, um, in a very like surreal way that is like mm-hmm. a lot of my style that it's not like um so literal but you know i've got like certain journal entries that are more like poetic and then imagery that kind of goes along with all of that and it's very tangible like it's really like um elements of my real life like 
seeds of foods that I was eating or matchsticks or like like saliva or like really like very like Mm -hmm. physically. This is me in this book. Yes, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. a documentation of time. So my uh, a more recent concept now that the book is concluding, I really want to incorporate AR where you could, um, you know, like you buy your copy of the book and it comes with like in the front cover, you can um, scan and it will like open up some form of program. I don't know the logistics mm-hmm. of any of this yet, but this is just what I see. Um, and, you know, I've seen stuff like this during my time at the Dali Museum. I was an intern there for museum management and they had just launched their um, their AR exhibit. Um, and so I know it's possible to basically be able to hover your phone over and have information like mm-hmm. that. So that's a goal of, that I want to see in the coming months, really. Um, so if you know anyone or if you think it would be something you'd be good at, definitely let me know because I would really love to be able to incorporate the technology to the book because, I, I mean, it's a marking of 2020. So I think what better mm-hmm. way to do that than to incorporate the emerging tech that's, you know, immersive that we're kind of – I think people underestimate how close it is. Like, I don't think people understand just how, um, how soon we'll be integrating uh, to, I mean, I could go really out there, but like, no, you're good. You're good. Keep we'll, going. Really, we'll really be integrating into mm-hmm. technology, like probably like, like the human form, you know, like transhumanism and like real. Oh shit. no, it's, Funny enough, um, if you remember him, Brady Robshaw, him, uh, him and his family, we're still like I, I hang out with him a lot, so I'm really good with his family. But like I went over to his house for dinner, and there was an entire argument because Brady wanted to put an RFID chip into his hand so that he could unlock and access all of his stuff um, <laughs> without having to like use a key or anything. And his parents are like, "This is dumb," and then. Uh, he was like, no, 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 it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. The RFID chips in my hand, I can just swipe oh, access to everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's really funny. But, you know, like, that's where we're at. Like, where are, if that's, if, if families are already arguing over this, mm-hmm. you know, and, like, just the idea that, like, I, I just really hope we evolve in a way that frees human consciousness um, rather than it being owned by, like capitalism, I really hope that it, I really, really hope we integrate and evolve in a way that leaves behind all of these archaic ideas of like the inquisition of Mm -hmm. um, over minority groups and all of that kind of stuff. Like I hope it, I hope what we design is a world where all of that stuff becomes irrelevant. Now, Amazon like owns how much? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, he got even richer today too, and it's kind of crazy. They're like saying like his net worth ballooned again, and it's like I thought you gave away half your money to your wife. How is it that you're already back at two hundred and fifty billion? It's like this. This makes no sense. It makes no sense. Yeah, it really does make no sense. But in in feeling so help like that, how does that leave us to not feel helpless? You know, so. I think mm-hmm. that a big part of like this this project has been finding gratitude even for that kind of stuff, allowing me to kind of process the world we do live in. And it's really difficult because it's designed and always has been designed to um, oppress us. <laughs> like it was designed... Mm-hmm. Well, not always has been because there's a time period of time before that design came about, but it's just right. so ingrained into our human consciousness at this point that it, it feels like that's all that exists. Um, so it can be a really intimidating thing, but I think, and in my conscious awakening and in my artistic um, evolution and all of that, like, I think it's just our job to kind of meet 
meet everything where it's at and rise above still. And so in a way, you know, the designers of the future are us, Julian, because Mm -hmm. I'm hanging out in VR and you you guys are designing cars that can ascend or, you know, working up to building the skills. Trying to design cars. Still, you're you're learning and you're practicing. Mm -hmm doing that stuff and so to me it's like a world that you and Brady and Jasmine Gay and I are like designing the future like Mm -hmm. that gives me hope you know that might be pretty cool we went to the same high school so if any group of if any kind of people like are doing that kind of stuff, I'm happy to see it's these people, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. But it's a cool thing. Like, it's a really exciting thing. And so I I think we have to just operate from that kind of headspace because otherwise it's just too fucking... Same old same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a more direct, like, yes, AR, VR is obvious, like, to me, as an artist, to evolve along with that technology, using all of the formal skills. Like, I have, I've done all of the stuff. I've learned, I've made my own paper and then printed on a, mm-hmm. pad and then etched into uh, it and all that shit, and then printed on a print press. Like, that's some mm-hmm. old ass skills. And I'm coming from that and ascribing it to the newest tech that emerges. But for me, I will, I will emerge alongside tech however tech evolves because that's the most strategic way to to innovate you know and i'm i'm not artist. gonna lie what that was my least favorite class because uh my professor professor nan he was like all right everyone time to learn how to make your own canvas and we were like but we can go to walmart and buy it or we can go like this is back when um utrecht was still open in tallahassee Oh, so yeah. it's like we can just go down to Utrecht and get it. And he's like, no, 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 no. This yeah. this is how you make your own gift. Do it yourself. Like, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, why? Like, why are we doing this? But it's like, because that's what they used to do. And it's like, mm-hmm. this doesn't make any sense. But okay, I'll do it. <laughs> but I think it does. It does. It has taught valuable skills to to learn like the ways that it used to be done and mm-hmm. stuff like that. I think just this the concept of being stuck in that is what is detrimental, like not evolving and just saying like, no, like oil. I mean, I love oil painting and I think that it has a space in today's world. Like I think that the mm-hmm. skills like need to exist. And I think there are need to be people who um, specialize in them and like want to stay in that. I just know me personally, I want to learn how to master that and I want to learn how to master whatever emerging tech comes. And I think that they can create this beautiful symbiotic relationship. I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive. Awesome. Pretty cool. I'd stayed as far away as possible from oil painting because, you know, my, my budget was, it was not able to handle that. It was bad. It was, it was very bad. Let me tell you, it's expensive. So I don't do it Mm -hmm. all. It's like a it's like a gift to myself if I decide I'm gonna sit down and do an oil painting, or it's a commission from someone else in their painting. True, and they know how to pay for um, supplies. That that part exactly, uh-huh. and I know how to quote them properly with the supplies because mm-hmm. that adds a whole other cost. <laughs> exactly, very cool. Do you have well, any other questions for me? No more questions. You were. You were an excellent interview. Um, I have two recommendations, sort of. So sure. I don't know really much about how AR gets done when it comes to the app. I do know how to finesse it and get around it, though. You may not like this answer, but uh, the way we would do it is we would just put QR codes in the pages so that when you scan it with your phone, it kind of just overlays an image on top of it. So that was the cheating way of doing it. But we didn't actually learn how to use AR. But it's that was... It- so you'd put now I'm curious so you would put like a QR code on each page and then Mm -hmm. opens what does it open so if you put the QR code on each page then you would have to either have um 
I, it either would have to be directed towards an app that had pre-built in filters, or you would have to like bring it into a website. It's, um, I don't think we ever really looked at uh, bringing it in with websites, but it would work as it scans the QR code in the corner and then it takes you into um, a different environment where it's the, the additive elements are already there. So it's just kind of like showing you the camera feed and then the additive ed elements so around it. Be the camera. So like, that's the cheat way of doing it. Okay. Well, I mean, that's really good to know. So that, I mean, that mm -hmm. right there is at least helpful. I feel like it makes sense. I'm not opposed to that. You know, I'm going to, investigate some more as well but that's good to know that there's a loophole because i'm a fan of a fan of making yes. life easier um so much of my degree was learning how to finesse and not kill people at the same time <laughs> because it or was... just hopefully not kill people and um it's okay if they die if we get more money yeah that part too there was like the entire engineering ethics class was it was very macabre where it was like yeah, we could recall all these cars, but paying out all the death lawsuits only a, amounts to 100 million versus recalling everything, which is 500 million. So don't recall the cars. That would be and the they, Pinto, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Is, oh my goodness, it was beautiful. Yep. Right. That's what happens when you put a gas tank in the trunk of a car. Mm -hmm. Who would <laughs> And um, so what was the other thing you were gonna suggest? The, oh no, the, um, Sorry, I may have said that wrong then. Okay. The, the two things I could say was that I didn't know how to do AR properly, but I did know how to finesse it. Those were, those oh, okay. were my, okay. No, well, that's very, no, that is very helpful. And um, if you know, if you think of anyone or if you end up like posting this and any of your friends or anything say, oh, I know how to do that. Definitely let me know because I'm interested in collaborating with somebody who might know a little bit more because um, Most definitely. Okay. Well, um, well, now that the interview's over, I can tell you, I guess, what the project is. But uh, I guess. Well, sign, do you want to we can, we can sign. Live, So let me. Let okay. Me. Yeah. Thanks for watching. If you did, anybody and everybody. <laughs> okay. So let's see.